Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is Tracy Cook with SACS Healthcare Communications and I'd like to welcome you to today's event. I also wanted to show our audience how you can send in questions throughout the webinar. Our speakers will answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Shannon Gallagher. Shannon is a recognized innovator in healthcare safety. In 2012, he contributed a chapter title Technology and Medical Errors in William Sharney's book, Epidemic of Medical Errors in Hospital Acquired Infections. Shannon has published nearly a dozen manuscripts pertaining to communication, SPHM models for care, gender inequity during the COVID-19 pandemic, and more. His most recent contribution is to the American Nurses Association, SPHM, National Standards Publications, which is due for publication in 2022. Shannon, welcome. Thank you, Tracy, for the kind introduction. The title of our webinar today is Caring for the, the Obese Patient, Challenges and Solutions We Should Consider. Speaking on this very timely topic are two exceptional experts, Susan Gallagher and Rhonda Turner. Dr. Gallagher is certified in bariatric nursing and is a certified safe patient handling professional. She is immediate past president of the Association for Safe Patient Handling Professionals, associate editor for Workplace Health and Safety, AAOHN, and has been on the editorial boards of JWOCN, OWM, and the Journal of Bariatric Nursing and Surgical Patient Care. She serves on a number of international boards and is a recognized speaker on skin and wound care, outcomes, bariatrics, ethics, and risk and loss control across the globe. Rhonda is the Nurse Operations Support Specialist, focusing on the medical surgical service line specifically, education, onboarding, and leadership at Banner Health. SPHM and fall prevention has been a large part of her life and has inspired her to become involved as a leader in her facility, region, system at national and international levels. She's an active ASPHP board member since 2019, and Rhonda has been an integral part of the trends nationally and internationally with SPHM fall prevention and caring for patients of size in early mobility. Our speakers disclose no relevant financial relationships. And we do offer continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists for this presentation. A link to obtain credit will be available at the end of the webinar. And this educational activity is supported, so approved for one contact hour for nurses and respiratory therapists. Our accreditation statement is below and support for this educational activity is provided by Dale Medical Products. Now, We'll turn the presentation over to our two wonderful speakers, Susan Gallagher and Rhonda Turner. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon Gallagher, and I really appreciate the opportunity to present today with Rhonda Turner. We're going to go ahead and turn our webcams off and um, get started with our presentation. So with that said, these are the learning objectives that were attached with the invitation that was sent to you. However, what we'd like to do at this point is to talk about, um, just to take a minute to explain these a little bit more fully. This presentation will look deeper into these opportunities by first describing the prevalence of obesity in the general population and then in healthcare settings. Trends will be presented as they relate to pre-planning for reasonable care across practice settings. And despite an awareness of wheelchairs, walkers, commodes, bed frames, support surfaces, we found that other size appropriate devices that support safe care are often overlooked and we'll be talking about those. You know, it's very interesting because as Rhonda and I prepared this uh, presentation, we felt that it was it really felt like we were changing lanes a lot. And that's the reason why we've had this theme of the road is because we're gonna cover a lot of information. We're gonna cover it very quickly. And if you have questions or ideas at the end, I really, we really encourage you to um, send in those questions. And if you have additional questions, never hesitate to um, contact us. So what we also want to do is we really want to talk about the relationship between obesity and COVID-19, and that's woven throughout the presentation. So that's what we're going to start with, is these lessons learned in the global pandemic. And so we'll go back one slide because we're, we're there we go, that's perfect. So a number of lessons have been learned, and Rhonda's going to talk with us a little bit about those. 
Yeah, we have learned so much since 2019 to 2020, and we have much to learn. Definitely seeing obesity on the rise for I think of multiple reasons, and I've done some studies within my own facility and that demonstrates that it's not just COVID. So I appreciate um, what we're the how Susan presented. Um, we're going to be changing lanes a lot. When we want to go in, we want to do a comprehensive care. Uh, and really, it's taking care of multiple things at one time when we're caring for patients at the bedside. Exactly. And before we move to the next slide, I just want to talk about the evidence that tells us that there is a relationship between obesity and severity of illness associated with a COVID-19 infection. And there are a couple reasons that we think that this is uh, happening. The first is perhaps facilities just do not have pre-planning in place. And there have been delays in equipment access, diagnostics, and treatment. The second reason has to do with, you know, a person with a high degree of adiposity is in a chronic hyperinflammatory state. And when the body is exposed to further inflammation or infection, it responds with what has been described as the cytokine storm with increasing frequency and severity. And so we're gonna share now what some healthcare professionals have told us about the challenges that they see in the uh, COVID pandemic. And we're gonna share some of those lessons learned with you. So these are the areas that we wanna talk about right now. And this is our first big lane change <laughs> as we're gonna jump right into this. And so we wanna do it rather quickly, but the um, first lesson learned had to do with the challenges in pronating the person who was not only immobile, but who was also categorically obese. And the first thing I wanted to share, and then I'll be interested in what Rhonda has to share because she's got some great ideas as well. But the first thing I wanted to share with you is that the Association for Safe Patient Handling Professionals, ASPHP, which I will make reference to at least three times in this hour, has a free uh, COVID-19 toolkit. And within that toolkit, there's information for you in terms of uh, safe ways to pronate certain types of patients. Also, there are healthcare facilities that have posted some really great uh, tools for you and your vendors have that as well. Rhonda, share with the group a little bit about what Banner has done in terms of safe pronation. So we have a very engaged, proactive um, unit-based council. And a year before, in 2019, before COVID even hit, it was brought to them that prone, proning patients will healthily increase um, the respiratory expansion. And so the RN operations support specialist that works on the critical care service line did the research, learned how to prone patients, and the practice council started training the staff a year before COVID hit. And it was evident that that was such a valuable lesson once we had COVID there. I got to help out as helping hands in the critical care unit one night and those staff members were working like a well-oiled machine. It was fabulous. I felt like a proud mama. <laughs> so and also seeing it, the national focus on this. I remember Ronnie, my husband and I, we were watching Lester Holt one night and they were talking about proning patients and how that's helping the recovery process. So it's definitely something that we need to look at to keep our staff members safe and our patients safe. Excellent. And I know that we really don't have this um, in the body of this presentation, but to say that all patients of size do better when they're lying on their belly just because of that expansion, which you just talked about, uh, Rhonda. The next lesson that we wanted to talk about in the global pandemic is full body lateral rotation therapy. This is not turn assist, but this is a full body turn. And I, I welcome questions about this at the end of this presentation, or if you have questions in the future. But this is considered an adjunct to turning and repositioning for purposes of skin health, promoting skin health and preventing worker injury. You know, some of you have um, products that use a bed frame to do this turning. Some of you have support surfaces that do this turning, um, but regardless, it really is a nice adjunct for you in your patient care. But keep in mind, you'll still wanna provide repositioning. In other words, you'll place pillows under the patient's um, belly, under their breasts, under their arms, between their knees to support their tissue. 
Now, the ne next lesson learned has to do with assessment. And of course, this is a really broad term and it covers a lot of information. But what comes to my mind is being able to listen to breath sounds or abdominal sounds, um, bowel sounds, and how difficult that is through thick fatty tissue. And so that has been problematic. And I wonder, Rhonda, what are your thoughts about that? Has Banner done some something interesting or what are your recommendations to really look at assessment and how we can overcome some of these barriers? Well, definitely um, respiratory wise, there's some great stethoscopes out there that enhance the hearing. So I encourage to at least have one available on each unit um, just so that we have that access. Because typical, the, the normal stethoscope just doesn't quite cut it and you definitely want to give a clear assessment. We also include the mental status of the patient. Please don't forget about that, especially during these times when everyone is so emotionally um, stretched. It's such a key piece. And then we can talk later about the four eyes skin assessment that we do, Susan. Yes, absolutely. We will talk about that. Um, Let's talk about that right now. Just move order okay. a little bit. You know, when we talk about wound care, we'll come back to diagnostic studies, but when we talk about wound care, we think about how important it is to look between skin folds and, um, uh, and then also um, the buttocks area because we know that pressure injury does not occur on the sacral area of a person with size. And we talk about that in a, a few times within the context of this presentation. And um, it really does develop over the buttocks, not the sacral area. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about medical device related pressure injury and how that's so much more prevalent uh, in the presence of obesity. But yeah, tell us a little bit about the four eyes that you do at your facility. Being proactive is key, Susan. Everything that we do, we've gotta think, start thinking ahead. So Banner implemented, oh gosh, I think it's, it's been quite a few years ago that we created a four-eye skin assessment. And what that means is a registered nurse must look at the full body under all the folds, all the medical devices, and another, a secondary nurse must look at this patient together to identify um, if there's any skin issues upon admission. And be sure and ask the patients too, if they have any areas that, they, that feel uncomfortable. And then we can be more proactive um, involving the wound care team. If we do find some pressure or some wound care issues upon admission, then we can prevent those from getting worse throughout the hospital stay. We also do that with every patient, every transfer, um, whether from floor to floor, and if they've been in a procedure, because it doesn't take long for pressure injuries to develop. So especially if they're in for a long surgery, we want to make sure that we have a second set of eyes on looking at that skin every time. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I think that's so important. Um, so I know we changed, I know we changed order a little bit, but let's talk about diagnostic studies now and some of the challenges we have there. And it's important for us to understand the patient's girth, their width, and their body weight in relation to diagnostic studies. And sometimes we send patients down for exams and the exams can't be accomplished. And it's very frustrating for everyone. So I think Rhonda, you're gonna talk about gap analysis a little bit later on, but it's so important to recognize that in the equipment that you have in the diagnostic areas, what is the, the bore size or the girth uh, for certain types of diagnostic um, studies? And then what about table weight limits and then also table widths? And so these are all really important. The important thing about weight limits is not only um, getting the patient on, you know, onto it, but it's to be able to move the tables uh, in those diagnostic areas. Do you do anything special with diagnostic studies, Rhonda? I completely agree. It, I think using simulation, if you do have a bariatric simulation suit, you can try that. Um, and again, being proactive, like knowing your equipment before the patient goes down for the test and finding out um, that they can't fit or something doesn't work right. It's uh, just, it puts the patient in danger as well as the staff. So just know your equipment ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of segues to intubation. And before we talk about the prevalence of obesity in the general population and in healthcare facilities, I wanna talk about intubation. I wanna talk about two different elements of that. 
The first is please have an anesthesia professional lead your team to identify whether or not you have proper intubation tools, if you have proper training, documentation, and follow-up. And this would not only be in your adult population, but your children as well. We have a number of children over the age of 12 years old who can be upwards of 200, 250 pounds. And because of their very short stature, many of them and many of them carry their weight around their neck, intubation can be extremely challenging if your team is not prepared for that. The second thing I want to talk about is the tracheostomy tube. And I, again, I, I can say we talk about this throughout the presentation, but it is a lesson that we learned through the global pandemic. And that is, you know, a lot of patients will have their trachea deep within fatty tissue around the neck. And so the surgeon will have to create a pretty significant surgical wound even to identify the trachea. So you've got a patient who's got a large wound who's got the tracheostomy tube and then has those tracheostomy tube ties that can burrow into the soft tissue if the ties are made of the textile or the linen. So we have a combination of issues that can happen around this respiratory care. And we're gonna come back to this in a little bit, but now we're gonna talk about the prevalence, um, increasing prevalence of obesity in the healthcare setting. So interesting point. Um, partnering with your data informatics team is a, such a valuable lesson. Uh, in my journey, my 35 year journey in healthcare, I had the opportunity to work as a quality improvement specialist for a year, and it really opened my eyes to how much data can impact the outcomes. So knowing how to get that data is such an important fact. It helps you to be proactive in looking at the trends and then for instance, I created a patient weight and height report so I could look at the BMI trends, and I have that information to share with you. But also, being in tune with your st frontline staff, if you have a solid culture of safety, your staff are going to come to you and tell you um, what they're seeing. They're going to tell you we're running out of equipment. So ask them, and that's kind of what sparked my um, interest in seeing where our trends were because definitely more staff are saying we're seeing more patients that are heavier and it's just we need more um, support for that. Did you have anything else to say about that, Susan? Sorry. Just to say, oh no, that's fine. Just to say that um, it's really great to be able to identify from an informatics perspective, the prevalence of obesity in your particular health setting. But the key to that is intersecting that with mobility level. And I know Rhonda's going to talk about this in a little bit, but you may have a 700 pound person who's completely independent. And the care challenges are really the 300 pound person who's completely dependent. So if you can identify a way to intersect mobility with what your findings are uh, in your electronic health record. But Rhonda, you're going to share some data with us, aren't you? I am. So I looked, started with 2021, um, January through August, and I realized during that time frame, we had 754 patients that were greater than 300 pounds admitted to our facility. And we are about, we are licensed for 225 beds. So this includes the patients that came through the ED that were admitted and also our inpatient setting. And then I started going backwards, looking at the data. In 2020, we dropped to 642 patients that were over um, 300 pounds. But back in 2015 and 2016, we were around 400 to 450. And what was interesting, the jump from 2017 to 2018, I'm not sure what happened there, but um, we had a 63% increase in patients over 300 pounds coming to our hospital. So you just think about all of that, that everything that that entails, like, um, for staff injury, patients' needs, and how we need to adapt our own um, healthcare setting. What was interesting too is their BMI went down. I did an average height, uh, very, very um, about 10 different samples throughout that time period, and the average height was about 5.8, so five feet eight inches. And that's how I estimated the BMI. So from um, 2014 to 2021, we went from 54.3 BMI to down to 52.4. I just find that interesting. Susan, do you see this around the nation? Because you have such a big umbrella picture of obesity with all the work that you've done and the trends. Right, so this is really interesting to me. Although I think if we map this out between BMI 30, which is categorically um, 
overweight, no, obese, up to, you know, a higher BMI, I think that two points in a BMI is not that much. Maybe we could even consider this stable. I don't know. What do you think, Rhonda? I don't, it just was interesting to me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I don't know if the patients are coming in earlier or I don't know. Yeah, that's very interesting. Definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Well, and one of the other thoughts I had was what if it was because of our increased um, surges in, oops, sorry, I got <laughs> click happy there, our increased surges with COVID, you know, and so as we measure our falls per thousand patient days, I took that same formula and put um, patients greater than 300 pounds over the thousand patient days and the same trend line. So we're definitely seeing an increase and this validates what we're seeing in the raw numbers. Uh -huh. So we've got a lot to um, really pre-plan for. Uh -huh. And that's really what we're talking about right now is, you know, how do we do that? What is reasonable accommodation and how can we pre-plan for that? And Rhonda, I know you've done a really great job with that. I know there are a lot of facilities that have done a lot of great work around pre-planning for care. But when we talk about reasonable accommodation, what we're really talking about is, uh, can we provide a standard of care irrespective of a person's body weight, weight distribution, or level of mobility? And then the next question is, how can we pre-plan for that? And, um, you know, when we talk about demographics, I would like to share that, you know, in 2020 was the first time that we saw increase in frequency and severity equal among men and women. Typically, we've seen increase frequency of obesity among women and increased severity among men. Um, and so that really helped, all, has always helped us in looking at our pre-planning, but now we're looking at you know both groups. And then we also say the issue with weight right now is as a result of the COVID-19, you know, there are those scientists who are talking about the COVID-29 and that's, you know, the average person right now has gained about 29 pounds in the last 18 months. And I think a lot of that has to do with our disrupted life patterns that are really um, affecting us and profoundly affecting the person with, who is severely obese. So, you know, pre-planning is your foundation, but you have to understand those gaps before pre-planning can happen. And now Rhonda's going to talk a little bit about um, gap analysis. Yes, yeah, so this is awesome this is a, you've got to find out where your gaps are before you can make any progress so banner health has this awesome gap assessment that we've been doing for several years previously it was tied to incentives and then we we didn't do it for a couple of years and we've realized how we need to co come back to this so the full assessment um, is also available as a reference in the ana 20, 2022 sphm guidelines so um, you can look for it there this is how this works is each category is scored zero there it's not been started and four is fully engaged so each heading has seven four to eight questions and you go through as a team and score them so this will make a little bit more sense on the next slide but we did add fall prevention and we've also also had caring for patients of size and one more point before i move on when we did this as a system in 2015 we are trying to figure out how to bring the most energy to what we need as a system to make the greatest impact. So what's one single intervention that we can do that's gonna make an impact? So the four lowest scoring categories were management, leadership, and program oversight, education and training, program monitoring, improvement and evaluation, and then caring for patients of size. So those four areas is where we honed in our energy to try to make a difference. And we're seeing some sustainable practices now in all those areas. And this is what the actual uh, section for caring for patients of size looks like. So again, you have the major heading and then you go work through as a team. Um, you could divide this up, get, just get creative. So again, each subtitle, you score zero for not operational and four for fully operational. Then you identify the needs and create an action plan. So the biggest, um, concern that we have too when we care for bariatric patients is do we have the right equipment? So we develop plans to purchase or rent bariatric safe patient handling equipment based on an annual program review. So again, you have to be consistent. 
then it just goes through various um, different questions. And the other piece of this that we've added is we utilize bariatric scenarios within SPH and education. Again, if you don't have a simulation suit, we found it very valuable to have access to one here at Banner. And this was our mobility assessment tool that Susan was talking about. And what it is, is a nurse-driven assessment to really identify what equipment to use to safely mobilize your patients. Then they, the primary RN will do the assessment and it's four different steps. So for testing the core strength, you have the patient sit up and shake your hand across their, their um, body. And then if they are ordered bed rest, then we know that we need to use a ceiling lift, um, anything that is completely dependent on us to transfer the person. And then the stretching point, then we can start using a little bit less equipment and it just segues up to where they're walking independently. But we also wanna, of course, keep in mind um, our fall pre prevention in BMAT level four. You know, Susan, you always talk about including the patient in conversations um, when you're talking about moving and asking them how they move. Well, funny story, um, when we were just getting our Safe Patient Handling Champion program up and running, it was myself and Ronnie that were the primary champions here at NCMC. And so we um, started getting calls uh, from different units saying, hey, can you come assess the situation and see if we can do something different for the equipment? So we got called and we were um, being all champion-like and uh, looking at this situation, the patient was about 6'4", um, about 500 pounds, and immediately Ronnie's like, we need a different bed. So we went and proudly got the different bed, came down, and then we were trying to position it in the room where we could do a lateral transfer because that would be the best method, right? So this conversation went on for a good 15 minutes and we did involve the patient, but after um, about 15 minutes, we were pretty much stuck in, in how we're gonna move forward because of the size of the room and the, the angles. So um, there was this moment of awkward silence and the patient goes, well, I could just walk over there. I'm like, oh yeah, why don't we plan on that? <laughs> so you know, it was just a lesson learned, the, those preconceived ideas that we don't think our patients can ambulate because they're um, a patient of size. So great lesson learned, Susan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me giggle every time. Mm -hmm. And this is how we correlate the BMAT to the equipment for bariatric patients. So again, just because a piece of equipment is big doesn't mean it's built for a bariatric patient. We see that a lot, especially with bed psyched modes. Just because the girth is wide might mean that it's still able to, um, the weight limit is only 350 pounds but it looks like it could accommodate somebody that would be 600. So um, lateral devices, um, air devices are really phenomenal with bariatric patients, but this is just a, an example of how we can correlate the BMAT level to the correct equipment. And if you don't have that equipment in-house, make sure that you have a, a good rental plan and that you have access to it. For instance, we, we have several bariatric beds that and equip pieces of equipment, um, our size-wise chair that's on site that we can just go up and get. Uh, any other key points with that, Susan? I think just, I just knowing think, what you have. Yeah, I, I just love this diagram that you've created and that you've linked mobility to the safe patient handling product. I think that's wonderful. And I think what you've done here is you've recognized that, you know, a piece of equipment with a thousand pound weight limit does not necessarily accommodate the person who weighs a thousand pounds. We haven't talked about body distributions, uh, weight distributions, and that really does impact things as well. So I think what you've done here is really, really great, Rhonda. And so to that end, you know, we have talked about lessons learned. So far, we've talked about um, prevalence of obesity in healthcare. We've talked now about gap analysis and some of the common equipment wheelchairs, walkers, commodes, bed frames, support surfaces, lateral transfer devices that many of you may have. What we wanna do now is again, make another lane change. And we wanna talk about those things that we often don't, don't think about. And so there are four areas we're going to touch on. Um, the first is respiratory consequences of obesity. Then we're gonna talk about wound care and pressure injuries. And then a little bit about safe mobility. And then we're gonna to continue to relate this to COVID-19. So in the next 
slide, we start talking about the respiratory consequences of obesity. And so there are respiratory situations that impact care. And the first is obesity hypoventilation syndrome, which really impacts the O2-CO2 balance. And many people who are obese are also hypercapnic. And so in the clinical setting, if we raise those O2 levels to what is considered normal, we may depress respirations because the drive to breathe has been altered. So this is the first key. The second uh, issue is the displacement of abdominal tissue when the person is either in the supine or high Fowler's position. And Suzanne Burns has done phenomenal research even over the past two decades, helping us understand how this happens because both, both of these uh, positions really reduce ventilation because the abdominal tissue presses into the thoracic cavity. So to be aware of that. And the third issue I'd like to talk about is the clinical sequela associated with tracheostomy creation. And we talked a little bit about that earlier, but to know that there are alternatives for you that will help prevent injury. And so the next slide kind of illustrates that issue. So that's right. So what you see here is a medical medical device related pressure injury. And so the tracheostomy wound of course is larger and you can see the tracheostomy tube ties the linen ties have really burrowed into the soft tissue of the back of the patient's neck and even the front of the neck and this is especially uh, concerning in cases uh, when pronation is in place. So there are some solutions and I'm going to um, just share those with you now. Um, I wanna share how this um, tracheostomy tube holder can be a benefit to you. The, uh, it is 22 inches in length and it has a moisture wicking lining that helps reduce some of the skin breakdown associated with moisture that accumulates in the folds. And it's really easy for healthcare providers to apply. And those of you know that when you're trying to apply these in an urgent situation, they can really be stressful. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is respiratory uh, care and continence considerations. And I know many of you are uh, WOC nurses and in your 2021 uh, core curriculum, there is a chapter on incontinence and obesity where I describe this phenomenon we're gonna talk about right now in detail. The first is that 70% of individuals with a BMI greater than 40 uh, will have obstructive sleep apnea. And you know this is largely misunderstood. When we think about continence, we don't always think about it being a respiratory care issue. But in, um, obesity is an independent risk factor for urinary incontinence, and sleep disruption leads to the dysregulation of the antidiuretic hormone. And a number of studies have shown that even addition of a CPAP can be a method to manage urinary incontinence. So really think about that relationship between respiratory professionals and your continence professionals. If you have any questions um, about this, I would encourage you to, again, um, ask at the end of the program or you can always contact us. So the next area I wanna talk about is uh, wound care and pressure injuries. And so pressure injuries in the obese person is really quite different. And as I mentioned earlier, sacral pressure injuries seldom exist because the sacrum isn't the point of contact. The second factor is the skin is really different because of the amount of fatty tissue present. It's just harder to access nutrients. And finally, pressure injuries can hide. Damage can start at the very deepest level in the body near the bone. And these are often missed until they open up and then damage is profound. And I'd like to move to the next slide where I have an illustration of this simulation suit that Rhonda was talking about. And this is how atypical pressure injury occurs. You can see this is about a 110 pound woman and she's wearing the simulation suit, which simulates to about 350 pounds. But you can see if she were laying flat in the bed, the point of contact would be her buttocks, not the sacral area. And so I think that that is key for your healthcare professionals and your colleagues to recognize when they're doing skin assessment. 
So let's, um, let's move forward then to uh, the next slide where we're going to talk a bit about skin fold management and tubes and catheters. So um, in terms of the skin, moisture associated skin damage can happen deep within the skin folds. And we know that there is a relationship, although they're separate, but there is a relationship between moisture associated skin damage and the occurrence of pressure injuries. So as Rhonda said before, I love the four eyes idea to really go through the body very carefully. And it's not just skin folds on the trunk. They can be on the lower legs, underneath the arms, behind the neck. Tubes and catheters must be repositioned every two hours. Otherwise, skin damage can occur as a result of that. If they're not repositioned, then a device-related um, securement device um, needs to be in place to make sure that we know where those tubes and catheters are. And before we talk about early ongoing mobility, which Rhonda does a great job with and she'll do in the next few slides. I just want to share with you a photograph of a patient that I took care of years ago. And this is a patient who developed a medical device related pressure injury. Some people ask what part of the body this is, and this is the patient's buttocks and um, upper thigh. And you can see that this is an indwelling urinary catheter that has burrowed into the soft tissue of this patient. And the patient was really quite ill and it was thought that the patient couldn't be repositioned. But the tragedy is no one really monitored the tube. And so this of course first started off as a, um, a, purple, a reddish area, a purplish area, and then necrotic eschar. And this is about 28 days into the wound and it'll go on to heal, but not without added cost for the patient. So this is the reason why securement devices can really be a benefit to you. So let me share with you in the next slide, this um, uh, Foley catheter securement de uh, device. And you can see that this is made of that soft stretchy material that kind of distributes the uh, pressure on the delicate tissue. It really does reduce that circumferential pressure that can happen, and it can be used for long-term or for uh, short-term use, and it is designed for the person who has larger upper thighs. The other product that I'd like to share with you is the uh, transducer holder. And sometimes we don't think about placing these on the patient's arms, but if a patient has a very large arm or there's a lot of tissue in the upper body, it just makes sense to use a um, securement device to hold these transducers in place. And, you know, they, um, they're they really nice in that you can identify um, where everything is located. And they're great when you're pronating the patient to make sure that these um, tubes are in a place where they're not compressing on that delicate uh, tissue. And the last thing I wanna talk about, I feel like I'm just going on and on, but we're gonna bring Rhonda back here in just the next slide. <laughs> is I do like to use the abdominal binder, uh, especially this binder that fits properly. And many of you remember in the day when we would take two or three binders and we'd either have somebody take them home and stitch them together, or we'd use um, safety pins to hold them together or place them on the patient and then use um, adhesive tape. But it is really nice to have a binder that completely accommodates the individual. What patients tell us is that they just feel more comfortable when they ambulate the first few times after surgery or after being sick for a long period of time because the binder, what they report is kind of hold things in place. What I like as a clinician is that there is provision for um, up to four um, uh, bulb drain collectors, which is really nice because otherwise when we're trying to mobilize the patient, there are all these bulbs hanging from the patient and that too can place the patient at risk for falls. So a lot of really great products that we sometimes don't think about, but that are available to us. And I agree. So I've seen so many patients come in, especially patients of size that have those dollar size moisture induced uh, pressure injuries strictly because of urine or sweat. So there's, we could, um, there's a couple options. Of course, we want to get them up and moving and we want that, um, there is a risk if they're not able to be up and moving yet, but we could put a Foley in that does increase um, the, you know, the possibility of getting a catheter associated UTI and we definitely don't want to cause harm. 
So as soon as we start progressing in that mobility, we can get that catheter out and perhaps we could use a Purewick. I don't know if you guys have seen these, but again, somebody needed a solution. Um, this husband was caring for his wife who was incontinent at home. He took a water bottle, cut a, slide, a slice of it out, stuffed it with gauze and hooked it up to his suction. And then he eventually got a patent for it. And now this is available um, within the healthcare system. And even it's, I've seen it advertised on TV. So all those inventions that um, Susan was showing is just, I just wonder how many were created by bedside staff um, because we have a need. So anything we can do to protect the skin. I'm not, it won't advance, there we go. Okay, so talking about mobility, so important. Uh, I'm so excited about this latest strategic initiative Banner has implemented. This was a pilot that started um, back in 2019 and we came together as a system-wide steering team and developed um, an early mobility clinical practice that went live in January, of, no, December of 2020. And what we did is we took that BMAT level and we added some umph to it. So now we have clear interventions to every BMAT level because we don't want, um, we really didn't know what to do with that number. Like we knew how to, that it was how to safely mobilize the patients, but were we really mobilizing? So now um, we have metrics that correlate with the mobility that we're doing. And starting with BMAT level one is where we really partnered with the skin and wound team. Um, it's such a synergy going on right now within Banner with fall prevention, skin and wound, early mobility. It's pretty fabulous. So this is where we want to start with that range of motion. And we also want to get that bed in the chair position because we want to he hemodynamically prepare the patient to stand. And, um, you know, when you're always supine, you just, your fluids become stable. So really um, getting those fluids moving by moving that chair up and, or that bed into the chair position three times a day. And then BMAT level two, um, we want them out of that bed three times a day. And this is when we would want to consider a PTOT consult. And then level three is when the magic starts happening. Whether you use um, safe patient handling equipment, we want that patient up and walking three times a day up to 100, between 100 and 150 feet. And then if they score a BMAT level four, we want them ambulating at least 100 feet, 150 feet or more four times a day. So we've already seen great progress. We have great um, metrics to follow the, the progression of this. And I'm just so excited to see where we're going to go. It really has already impacted the number of indwelling catheter days and length of stay. More to come on that in the national platform there. Floor rescue. I can't talk enough about this. Um, so when somebody falls, especially a patient of size, we've got to know what we're doing. And um, we have to have that confidence in our skills. And just like every other simulation, um, like we practice codes. So we wanna practice floor rescue as if it is a code. So everyone has a role and they know what to do. Because if the patient is laying on the floor, especially a patient of size, feeling that pressure of anxiety, of fear, of how am I gonna get up? Um, we want our team to be confident so the patient feels secure. So we developed this floor rescue algorithm and it's been quite successful. So if the patient falls, we check for, to make sure the scene is safe, the primary nurse starts assessing. If there's no injuries, then we proceed to get that patient up. Meanwhile, while that primary nurse is keeping that patient um, comfortable and calm and doing what they need to do, because that patient's not gonna fall any further, right? So just do what you can to um, decrease that anxiety. The secondary caregiver is getting the right equipment. So we make sure that we have what we need when we need it. And then this also talks about the post-fall um, huddle process because we wanna come together as a team and recognize how we can pre prevent this from happening in the future. So um, again, this is a consistent process throughout Banner and it, we've had great success. And being able to have access to the suit that um, Susan sent us for grassroots trials, we've done a number of things with the, with the bariatric sim suit. We got it on the helicopter to look at size and space. And then we are opening up a bariatric surgery center or process, it's not a full center, but, and we wanted to do some training um, with the floor rescue because as we were in the beginning stages of this, um, we were talking about ambulation and whatnot. And the staff said, oh, we're not gonna need any safe patient handling education because our patients are BMAT three and four, so they're able to ambulate. And like well, what if they fall? So that kind of opened the 
door to uh, creating the simulation. So uh, our model um, is one of our simulation educators and she has some great reflections on what it was like to be in that suit, just as Martha did earlier on. And so we, they did a great job in putting the procedure sites and then also having that IV access in that sleeve. And that, it's just creative, creative stuff. And we set up the scene as, and it was in the post-op area. So the two RNs were completing handoff report and they weren't at the bedside as they should have been. Um, but when they walked in, our patient was reaching for her purse and her panis went over the side of the gurney and it took her to the floor. So side rails weren't up. So a lot of lessons learned and courses was eye-opening um, because you really, honestly, you don't have a whole lot of falls in the um, surgical area, the uh, post-op areas. So just a couple things, um, lessons learned, is we looked at, um, let me go back one. See how she's positioned with her head towards the wall? When you're doing a floor rescue, you always want the head towards the base of the lift. So they had to um, work as a team to get the sling underneath her and then work as a team to slide her around to where we could get the lift um, in the right position. And just a little bit about um, empath empathy and keeping that patient calm. Um, the model expressed that when the nurse was standing over her, looking down on her, she felt more anxious, when as the one that sat down next to her was so much more, um, she felt like she was part of the team then. So just be conscious of um, your body actions, um, your facial expressions as well. And what we learned in this was um, such a valuable lesson for simulation needs, but when they got the patient up in the air, they realized that they couldn't get the lift underneath the gurney. So that created a lot more anxiety. Um, we were able to, um, they did great problem solving and got it worked out, but just a great realization. Have you heard any other things around simulation, Susan? I think you've done a really great job with using the simulation in many ways. You know, I think it was uh, in Nebraska, the simulation suit was used by the CFO who walked from the executive suites throughout the entire facility. And it's because of that one day experience, um, there were uh, bathrooms that accommodated individuals of size. I mean, even if you think about when we sit on a toilet, that toilet paper holder is right there where the person's thigh would be. And I've had so many patients and visitors report that they develop skin injury from rubbing on that toilet paper um, holder uh, in a bathroom that did not accommodate their body weight or body distribution. So it is really nice, you know, even to have the simulation suit on and walking from the parking lot to wherever an outpatient might be visiting the facility because there are so many things learned, curbs that maybe the person wouldn't see because of body weight distribution. Um, but yeah, it has been used in so many different ways to help us really understand what, what the issues um, might be. Well, I, I think it brings out in every model that I, because I usually go in with the like positioning and talking about caring for patients of size and whatnot, but what comes out, comes out of it are great conversations around empathy. Mm. So important. Yeah, exactly. Well, Rhonda, thank you for sharing all that information with us. I think that's really important. Um, you know, just to uh, reinforce that there needs to be an awareness as we continue with special considerations associated with obesity in the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, and that a lot of our patients are sick for a very long period of time and continue to need our intervention. One of the goals, the underlying goals of this presentation was really to address the common preventable and predictable consequences of care by way of better understanding things. So with that said, I really want to thank um, all of you for um, your patience with our frequent lane changes. And as we conclude, I think we covered a lot of information. And now I, um, I think we welcome questions. Unless Rhonda, did you have anything else that you wanted to share before we go to questions? No, I think the importance of just making sure that we're caring for each other as well, especially during these times, um, it's just so important. I just always like to throw that out. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Our patients are going through the same feelings um, as our caregivers are. So just uh, be conscious of that. Make yeah, sure you do something for you today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. 
and again, thank you very much. And uh, as we move forward, let's take some questions. I'll go ahead and ask uh, Shannon and Rhonda to turn on your cams. Susan, before we go to questions, we have yes. an announcement about CE accreditation. All right, thank you. So we'll go to those slides now. Susan, Rhonda, thank you so much for the wonderfully informative presentation. Uh, we do feature continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists associated with this webinar. Uh, this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. To obtain CE credits, go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash P. You will need to register at this site, complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. Support for this educational activity is provided by Dale Medical. We also have an archive version, which means an archive and on-demand version will be available on www.perspectivesinnursing.org, and an email will be sent to all registrants when this is available, so you will receive an email in your inbox with this link. The on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists, and again, we're thankful to Dale Medical for their support. Uh, we do have some questions at this time. Uh, we do have some questions in the question box, so we're going to start out. I'll set down my script and we'll go to that. Uh, I'd like to begin with Gaston Cartagena, who asked, what are the key proven interventions to consider in a protocol to maintain skin integrity for obese patients? And Susan, I know that goes back to your slide about mobilizing early and often, but can you talk a little bit more about what those interventions look like? Right. So I think the very first thing, and and um, I would encourage you to contact me because I can send you re references on how to put a pre-plan in place. But the very first thing is to assemble your team and to identify what the risk factors are in your particular facility. How to identify the patients who ought to fit into that pre-plan. Is it based on weight as that reconciles with weight limits on your equipment? Does it have to do with BMI, body distribution? But to identify the patient and then to look at criteria to um, to address that. Would it be implementing as Rhonda had kind of identified, you know, the equipment, wheelchairs, walkers, commodes, but, and then do you have training in place? Is there training to understand how to use these products? And then are you looking at outcome management? I'm really just kind of touching the surface on this. And at this point, Shannon, can you, uh, am I responding to the question properly or a different direction? What's your feel? Yes, I think I think it was covered in the slide set partially, but I think looking at what uh, kind of uh, policies and procedures intervention looks like above the floor level is useful as well. So, um, right, yeah. yeah, and there needs to be a policy in terms of the hospital making a commitment to providing care for the patient who fits certain criteria. But then there need to be pro procedures, and I say that's kind of your recipes for performing certain types of. Um, uh, care. I'm trying to say this really fast, but then you also have to understand what you have in your facility. So not just identifying your patient, but, you know, we talked about diagnostic services. That is so hard for patients and embarrassing when you wheel the patient to diagnostic and everybody looks at the patient and says, what are you guys doing? We can't accommodate this patient. It's humiliating and dehumanizing for everyone. So if you have additional questions about that, I can send you manuscripts to that extent, but it is kind of a, a recipe on how to put that together. Thank you for your question. I would like to add, you know, create a workflow just as we did with the floor rescue, like mm -hmm. from admin to discharge, a comprehensive, what do we need to look at? So create these scenarios, they're going off to diagnostic, they've had a fall, like what do you do in every scenario? Mm -hmm. So basically yeah. a protocol on how to keep advancing and not backsliding our bariatric BMAT ones and twos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Rhonda, our next question is for you. Can you talk a bit more about the value of an interprofessional team? Oh my gosh, we would not be anywhere had we not had a full comprehensive scope of team. The wider the scope of your team is, the better successful you'll be. And I think that's what that gap assessment, well, I, I know that's what the gap assessment was intended for because once you complete it, then you take it to leadership and like, and you say, this is where we need your support. This is what we need equipment. We need um, just oversight. We need your enthusiasm around safe patient handling. So 
just look back, I get goosebumps and a little emotional, just knowing where we started in 2015 to what's happening today. Like we have C-suite executives every day talking about early mobility. It can't get any better than that, right? So being yeah. having that full spectrum is just exactly what, what you need to envision and go after. I agree with that. And I have to say, you know, most of us have someone at home who we love who is categorically morbidly obese, right? And so I think that that is an underlying driver as well for this particular type of program, uh, especially in terms of sensitivity and then just some of the other basics of care. So yeah, I think the interdisciplinary team is really important. I agree with you, Rhonda, and to include everyone because you know we all, we all really wanna do a better job for certain patient populations. And if you need a solution, go to the frontline staff, the CNAs yeah, exactly. and nurses. They know what they need. So bring them to the table. Yeah, absolutely. Up next, we have two questions about the binders that were displayed. One's a little, a little different. The first question is, does the binder help with reducing skin breakdown? And I believe they're referring to those Dale uh, Foley catheter binders. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the binders, I thought someone would ask a question about precautions in using the binder. So, um, so anyways, but I'm going to ask this, this one first, uh, answer this one first. And yeah, absolutely. The binders can be helpful. We wanted to do study years ago looking at oxygenation, tra um, trans, um, oxygenation of the skin to see if we could predict which wounds would separate. But when there is pressure on the wounds, they have a propensity to separate. And that's why patients love the binders is because it does make them just feel like everything's being held in place. You don't want them too tight as to compromise uh, circulation, but they do help when the body's establishing that initially that tensile strength and that initial wound healing, keeping it from mechanically separating. So again, really complex question, um, but in the answer to your question, yes, if the binders are applied properly. And same with any other medical device, you wanna check under, under it often, reposition it. Perfect, and then uh, the, the second question um, associated with that is, are abdominal binders only best suited for post-surgery or any time? And I guess that goes to counterindications. I have patients who like to use them any time just because it feels more comfortable. In fact, some will say, can't I even use it when I'm laying down? And no, we want them to take it off um, for reasons that Rhonda just described. But it does feel better when we ask a patient to get up and move if the binder is in place. I guess it go it's from patient to patient. But, um, but yeah, they do really appreciate that when we're mobilizing them. Rhonda, what's been your experience? Do you use binders very much? Um, we're starting to see them more happen, use more often. Um, and we don't have those bariatric binders available. So we do see, like you talked about, people putting them together, Velcro to Velcro end, and trying to make it work. So, mm -hmm. but definitely um, with mobilization, definitely helps. Okay. Now we have two minutes left for questions and we have two questions that are largely about engineering controls and accommodating the bariatric patient. Uh, the first one is gonna be, how do we go about with CT, MRI, beds and scanners for diagnostic purposes? Uh, basically talking about spatial constraints and imaging. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with that? Rhonda, do you wanna share a little about that? And then if there's time, I can interject. Yeah, definitely. Um, the more mobile the machine is, the better. So. Um, definitely look to see what's out there in the industry and look at the space that you have and also make sure that you, um, the ceiling has the right accommodation to have the lift equipment. Uh, that's probably been the biggest barrier is um, because of the way the equipment is built, they can't get the lift in there. So make sure that you, um, when you're designing your diagnostic area, make sure that you have a lift that's accessible. And also before you widen the doorway, make sure the equipment will accommodate the patient's width because we see that happen a lot too. It's unnecessary yeah, expense. Yeah. And corners and bumps, the littlest bump can um, create an injury. Yeah. And a simulation suit is a useful tool for assessing that? Oh, definitely. Um, because it uh, gives you a, an idea, a visual of the size and the areas that would rub against something and cause an okay. injury. So, yes. 
it now reads uh, one till, which means our time is up. Uh, anybody who had a question that was not answered, get in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to follow up. I know there were a few multi-part questions in there that we just didn't have time for, and they were excellent questions. Uh, with that, uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you for attending this webinar. I'll turn the presentation over to Tracy for some concluding remarks. Thank you. We would like to thank all of our speakers for today's session, and we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. There will be a survey immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, and you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback, as well as a CE certificate of completion. In one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions in this link to obtain your CE credits for nurses at our please visit www.saxtesting.com backslash p and again we'd like to thank everyone for joining and for our presenters today and we hope you have a great rest of your day